We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was a really exciting race, right? The Tifosi don't disappoint, and neither they really does Monza. I love yeah. this race so much. Yeah, that was that was actually kind of delightful. Like, it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Monza. <laughs> Grazie mille. Uh, no, and I'm pretty sure I messaged you, and I was like, we're going to have such a competitive race towards the end, and, like, <laughs> This is going to be really, really good. Also, not to mention, like, constructors and drivers and, oh, my gosh, there's just so much, so much happened. It was so yeah, lovely. Th- this, this whole weekend was full of just so much went down, so many things to talk about, um, and, like, I was really happy. And one of my predictions was that there was going to be excitement at the front of the field, which yes. thankfully there was this race because, obviously, last week that was lacking just a little bit. Yeah, I'd like to say that my surprise and my oops both came true this weekend. So I wish we were giving ourselves points for that, but we'll cover that later. Um, But no, it was just excitement all around. It was really best case scenario, minus one for McLaren, worst case scenario for Red Bull. Um, Yeah, which, you know, we love to see. We love to see the papayas doing well. and We love to see Ferrari winning and we love to see Red Bull not getting maximum points. No, we don't. Let's 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 be real here. No, we do not. And I also oh, I want to. It was a great weekend. It for was Emily. A, it was a great weekend for you. But I will say I I don't think that it was a bad like obviously it was a bad weekend for Red Bull. But I thought it was more damage damage limitation than it was anything else because no I'm I'm not sure like spoken like a true Red Bull fan. Well, yes, and neither of them lost positions and you know Max managed to maintain and keep ahead of George who I know is your favorite. So, I personally think that it wasn't great and obviously Red Bull has serious fundamental issues that they need to fix in the car, but I don't think it was a disaster of a weekend. No, I mean they still scored points. It wasn't a complete disaster, but like the car is in not good shape. Oh no, the car is in terrible shape, and hopefully they do something over the next two weeks to try to start fixing this, or it's going to be a really long rest of the season for you know all the Red Bull fans. But I I think that you know based on where they qualified, it could have been worse and was not. I will accept. <laughs> but from a where we were like three months ago standpoint, four months ago, this is not good. Well, and, you know, Max said it best to himself, if we continue to race this way and I don't win, then, you know, and or no, if we continue to race this way and the car doesn't improve, like, obviously I'm not going to be winning races and we're not going to be winning the championship. I was like, nail, hammer, done. Good job, Max. <laughs> yeah, he, he he's feared that. And, like, even, like, this morning before the race, one of the interviews, he's like, yeah, no, I've lived in this before. Remember before I was, was a world champion and the car wasn't winning every race? Been there, done that. So clearly the the uh, yoga that he has par- allegedly partaken is um, helping with dealing with his stress levels. Yeah. Or and he just doesn't care because this is his hobby alongside his real career, which is sim racing. What a guy. What a guy. Well, before we just go dive right into the race, I do want to cover some news before we cover the race. So as we've all known, and I've dreaded, um all season mercedes did make the announcement that kimmy antonelli will be their second driver next to george next year also if you have not surfed the interweb and seen all of the memes about (laughs) toto picking his new favorite toy and george russell looking super depressed highly 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 suggest you do so because they're so funny there's a ton of them from this weekend um especially because kimmy you know wrecked george's car um so just Take a gander, go look, it's great. Um, I will say this until I'm blue in the face. I think this is a horrible life choice from Toto. It is so dumb and I don't understand it, but he did come out this weekend and say like, oh yeah, I've known that it was going to be Kimmy like five minutes after Lewis told me he was leaving. So it's like, thanks a lot for all of this drama, Toto, which really goes to show like Carlos didn't really have any shot in the world, even though there was speculation that he did. Um, I don't know. Are you are you still feeling like this is a good choice, Catherine, or this is like a choice? Or 
It's it's kind of the best choice. I mean, at, alongside Toto admitting that he decided on Kimmy like five seconds after Lewis made the announcement that he was going to Ferrari, um, that he like basically his insistence that Max was coming was basically all for show and like a big old shot in the dark, uh, which is like, why were you being so annoying other than the fact that you like to be petty, which is what it is. Toto does like being petty, especially when it comes to Red Bull and making we Christian love Horner's life annoying. Thing, we we do, that. we do. We're here for it. Honestly, it's like, what other option do they have at this point than to, to take Kimmy and to, you know, not Mick necessarily Schumacher. As, well, we, we can, we can go into what James Vowles was saying. As about K- Mick Schumacher. As says, he's, he's not special. Not special. <laughs> and I, I, I want to touch on that. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a second um, because that was definitely taken out of context. But I, I think that when it comes to Antonelli itself, like he'll be good eventually, but there will be a lot of growing pains. And unlike what George had to go through of, you know, three years at Williams and then he got to Mercedes, you know, Antonelli's got a steep learning curve, but he's also extremely talented. Um, so well, George it's... isn't good. That's why he sat at Williams for three years. Like, at the level of entering F1, George versus Kimmy, Kimmy is, like, leaps and bounds ahead of where George was. That's right. There was, no, there was no way that Mercedes was going to dump Botas until they were actually, like, ready to dump Botas, and George was showing what signs of life he did show at Williams. But... I think this is going to be a pretty big gamble for them. And I think that they're like 2025, whether they have a good car or not, is still going to be pretty painful for them. Yeah. I don't know. Which it's, is fine. I'm very against it, but. Yeah. I, I will say from, from Kimmy's weekend as a whole, because obviously he was also driving in F2. He had a little bit of a mixed bag kind of weekend. He finished 18th in the sprint race, which was won by future Haas driver, Ollie Behrman. We'll talk about Ollie again in a second. And then he also finished fourth in the feature race. So it was a little bit better. And Ollie Behrman finished seventh. Um, and then Ollie Behrman, of course, we might be seeing him in two weeks, but we'll talk well, about I, that later. We will. <laughs> but, we will be seeing Ollie. <laughs> probably there there's there's one caveat that has not been clarified yet but like i said we'll we'll talk about kevin magnuson in a little bit but before we got to talk about that let's keep it with with seats and contract rumors and allegedly valtteri botas is stakes first choice for a drive in 2025 so keeping him on for another year right now the rumor is that um, stake wants to give him just a single year contract and botas wants a one plus one um that would keep him into in the car into the new regulation which that would take him into audi and the real question is like can he convince audi to take him from the absolute disaster that is stake right now I don't, I don't know. I mean, he's not driving well, but the car also sucks. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to have a driver like Botas commit because he hasn't done anything of of recent years since he's left Mercedes. I don't think Audi wants to commit to a driver with so many question marks around him, but it makes sense for him to go into this like bridge gap year, whatever we want to call it. I mean, it makes logical sense. It's clean and simple. Um, we both said that Botas makes more sense over Joe, even though I like to make the argument that it doesn't. The driving kind of does speak for himself. Um, so, I mean, I don't really care, to be honest, like, who's in the second stakes. I mean, seat, that's, so. that's that's true. I think if, if Botas' option is one year or off the Formula One grid, I think that the answer is going to be he'll take the one year and just really hope that State gives him a car that will be, allow him to impress the people at Audi, like yeah. Mattia Bonato, who's going to ultimately make the decision. And then if if Botas decides to pass, then I think that their next target is going to be um, Bortoletto in in uh, in F two, um, who he won the feature race from the absolute back of the grid today. So that I was saw like the, that the big that was the big wild um, news of the of the support races. So it looks like he is going to be stakes target if Botas decides to pass on the the deal and if negotiations don't work out in the, the way Botas wants them to. I mean, we all like Botas. He's a great character personality to have on the grid, but he's just so pedestrian this year. Less than I pedestrian. Mean, I mean, honestly, you know, the 
we know the it's car the car, is, the car is not helping and the, and like even when it was an Alfa Romeo it was not good like Sauber cannot build a competitive car which is why Sauber is exiting Formula One and becoming Audi um so that's you know fundamentally you know you put Botas in a better car he's going to be having better results and I mean at one point he was into the points today and I I, I was like damn it I remember last week when I picked him for P10 and that was bad um but yeah it was it was not i mean it's never a good race no. for for steak but the, it's it's really this is i put this on the car yeah we're gonna like end up eating our shorts when audi comes and just just like does really well destroys and everyone hulk ends up on the podium after 500 000 million races of not i mean i would podium. i would love to see that just to see hulk on the podium because that would just be so momentous but yeah We'll see. He's gonna um, be like P three and just like bawling his eyes out. I oh, hundred percent. It it's gonna be great. But then to to move back to Mick Schumacher, who I know that you really want to see back on the grid, and I also want to see back on the grid. Um, let's talk media literacy with Catherine and Emily here on the Going Off Track podcast. It's um, so bad, Catherine. Because because like like did did james vowels say something mean about mick schumacher yes was james vowels also taking a little bit of out of context for the sake of a clickable headline also yes did james vowels have to walk it back because no one wants to deal with the ralph of, the the wrath of ralph schumacher also also yes ralph is a freaking problem like who puts a microphone in front of this man's face why like, why Honestly, I do feel like that's one of the reasons why Schumacher has had not, like not a lot of chances to come back onto the grid is because of the behavior of people in his camp, specifically Uncle Ralph. That poor kid. I, I honestly Austin think this that. Weekend. Did you see that? I did see that. Yeah, I, I honestly feel like if Michael Schumacher was in the position to be a little bit more involved, and obviously we we know why why he can't, and it's very unfortunate. I do think that Ralph would be put in his place rather quickly who knows i feel like he's just gonna talk because he's trying to stay relevant i mean also that but i i, I do feel like you know when, when it was coming to decide between Colapinto and schumacher for the opening to replace Sargent, um you know vows really said you know our you know we know what we're gonna get out of mick and we feel that we're going to get something different out of Colapinto, which yeah. Based on Colapinto's it's results, it's six one way, half dozen the other. Like, yes, I mean, yeah. Is Mick not a rookie? Yes, but is he still pretty untested because he crashed Wasn't a lot and didn't finish races and was in a horrible hoss? Like, also yes. So yeah, I don't know. I I think I think his time is coming to an end in F one, like to get a seat. But I think he'll continue to be a reserve driver. He does all of the testing at the factory, like between free practices before quality. He's done a lot of work for them, and I know he's really, really good at it. Like Toto, George, and Lewis have all said, like how, like instrumental he is to the team when it comes to that stuff. But I don't think that's enough to put someone in an F one seat. I I agree, and you know, may you know, obviously that's not as prestigious as being a Formula One driver because obviously F one is the pinnacle of motorsport, but it's still like that's a really important, valuable asset to have in your pocket that some teams don't necessarily have. And like, yes, you know, you can say that Jack Dewan at Alpine is basically the same thing. Alpine is not good, but you know, that's just because the car sucks. It's not because the drivers can't drive, and a lot of that information what? does come from Dewan. I mean. <laughs> but we is also, a whole different story. Alpine is a whole. <laughs> I mean, it might not be a great example, but it's well, like still Ferrari, right? Because Ollie Behrman is their reserve driver, mm -hmm. but he's not the one going out and doing all the testings. He's not simming a ton. So, like, yes, he's their reserve driver, and he's talented, but he doesn't offer the same skill set that Mick Schumacher does. Yeah, and and then also to add to the point of of you know with Ferrari, they also have Arthur Leclerc, who's their development driver, who does a lot of the other you know. That's also part and parcel of. I'm gonna call that the nepotism. <laughs> oh, it's full <laughs> nepotism. We know it's nepotism because like um, he he lost a seat in F2. So like, how good is he really to be a development driver? You know well, you I mean? can only be in F2 for so long. It's like the F1 Academy. So there's also that. Well, okay. Anyway. Getting back on track for Monza, let's talk yeah. Italian Grand Prix. So Charles Leclerc, King Charles, won 
this weekend in Monza, which is really exciting. The Tifosi were absolutely insane. Just oh, they yeah. stormed the track, which was really, really cool. Flags were everywhere. Everyone's in red when you're in Monza. Like, it's so, so great. They're going to have garden parties. It's going to be amazing. Yada, yada, yada. I did not see this coming in a million years. Oh, no. Fully did did not see that coming. And, and even when he was bitching on the radio about getting undercut after that first pit stop, I was like, oh, Ferrari's going to Ferrari. They lost all of their good luck last week oh. in Zanvoort. Like, this is going to this is going to go stupid. And then it just didn't. And they, no, they, they, just, and they just stayed out there and they managed to to nurse those tires. And I mean, the tire degradation was wild, really bad. especially toward the end. But they managed to, you know, or at least not, you know, Carlos managed to cling to P4, but they they both really managed to, to hold on. And, and Charles was able to hold off a surging Oscar Piastri, who if he had like one or two laps, Oscar would have won that race. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they were driving in different positions, which is why... Charles could keep his tires the way like longer than Carlos because he had four lap older tires than Carlos did but right. Carlos had to like defend and he wasn't driving in clean air and there were a lot of other things going on so I don't I saw stuff today of like oh this is why they're getting rid of Carlos because Charles is a much better driver and it's like they're driving in two completely different driving situations and he was defending so like just pump the brakes um, no, I still think I, they did way better than anyone anticipated them to do. And for them to get a win in Monza, like, Charles has had some really iconic wins this season, like Monaco and Monza. That's yeah, those those are special. the wins as a Ferrari driver that you want to win, especially, like, you know, as, as a, a Monagas driver, you want to win your home race and you want to win in Monza. Thinking about watching the gridwalk this morning and anytime like, Martin Brundle ran into anyone from Ferrari, it's like, how do you think we're going to do today? And they're like we hope it'll be fine like nobody not even like people in ferrari's camp thought that this was going to happen today that or they did and they're just playing little, little i don't i don't think key. so i i don't think that the um former ferrari staffers a former you know all of those people like they're gonna be a lot more honest and i don't think they saw this coming either i don't know i, I mean the people who know probably knew that they were going to have a more competitive car. The people who are, like, former employees and former whatever, like, they don't know what's going on. Like, we, I'm a Ferrari fan. I didn't see this coming, so. Nope, nobody did. But and they also brought a massive upgrade package to deal with, like, their bouncing issues, um, which clearly they figured out, you know, at least a little bit. But this, this, was, this was a real, you know, big moment for Ferrari and Ferrari saying, hey, we're also still fighting for the championship. Maybe not the yeah. drivers, but they're fighting in the constructors and, and they're really taking it to McLaren. And, you know, yes, we've been talking for, for the last couple of months about like Max versus Lando, Red Bull versus McLaren, but it's still Max versus Lando, but it's Red Bull versus McLaren versus Ferrari. This is going to be a three-way battle all the way down the line. Yeah. And someone who I think should be in talks because of how well they're driving is Oscar. Like, I know everyone's putting all of their money on Lando, but Oscar is showing us, like, give him a year or two and he will be world champion. Like, as long as McLaren can deliver him a car, I think he's a much, like, I don't want to say better, but he's just outshining and outperforming Lando. I know it's not like, you know, Lando has more points, whatever, but Oscar, just the moves that he makes, how he overtakes, how he approaches things, I think he is going to be a multi, you know, world champion. I agree. And, and this might be a hot take, but I think he will be a world champion before Lando is. Like I, I don't think I, Lando will ever be a world champion. I think the first world champion from this, from that driving team is going to be Oscar. I Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, Lando just, he has these moments where he kind of just gets his, in his own way. And like, yeah. obviously he had a much better start today than he did last week in Zandvoort. Cause last week in Zandvoort, like Max just made him look ridiculous, but Oscar just full on sent it totally caught Lando off guard. And I think that he was a little unhappy about the way that Oscar made that decision going into those first few turns. Um, and 
don't want to say that I don't, I don't want to be like Nico Rosberg who's trying to to manufacture drama that's not there but I do think that it's going to get a little bit testy between Oscar and Lando you know not necessarily from here on out but as we continue and as their partnership continues especially as long as McLaren continues to be successful yeah I think it's going to be a little bit testy because Oscar's like hey we're racing I'm just here to race and Lando I think from his perspective is like hey I'm the number one driver the team should favor me I should get the better strategy the better calls and I think Oscar's just like laying it all out on the track and it's like whoever's driving best this weekend like that it is what it is and I think he's you know I don't want to say like he's tired of sitting in Lando's shadow but I think he's kind of just proving the point of like, hey, I'm an extremely talented driver as well. And, you know, it is what it is. And there is a reason why McLaren went through all that litigation <laughs> and drama to make sure that he did not stay at Alpine. So I I, I think, and, and there's been a lot of comparisons lately of, you know, Oscar to like Kimi Raikkonen, which I see more and more of because Oscar just like, he just wants to race. And that's, that's all he wants to do. Like, he doesn't want to talk about it. He just wants to be in the car and he wants to be racing, which is very similar to Kimi Raikkonen, who just raced and slept. And, and he was there this weekend. He was there this weekend, which was also really fun. We love we love having a visit from the Raikkonens and we do miss, you know, Kimi Raikkonen on the grid. Um, but we have Oscar Piastri, who's basically like the second coming of Kimi Raikkonen until Robin Raikkonen makes it onto the grid in like 10 years. Yeah. Or maybe well, less. Oscar will pave the path for the exactly. Reckoning. But so. um, do you, what did what did you think of of you know I saw I saw this a little bit like people were were asking like did McLaren make the right call of like not forcing Oscar to give Lando the position because of where Lando is to Max in the championship. So that's hard. I think if if he would have like overtaken him in a straight in lap. 50. I think they'd be pissed. It was not even a fully completed lap. There were only so many corners, and I think he was just like driving the car how he could drive the car. I don't think it was like I don't know. I I understand what you're saying with like, oh, Lando needs to be at max, so we need to give him more points. Like I just I don't know. I think they're just really trying to get drivers like constructor points. And having Oscar and Lando up there, like, what if he let Lando by and then Oscar fell back and the what ifs answer buts? Like, I don't think just because you have a few more points than your part, your team member, like, you are obligated to give them the points. I, I don't disagree with you. I, 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 I think that there was, you know, like you said, if this was later in the race, it would definitely be a situation of we have to switch, especially, you know, considering what happened with Oscar's first win, which was completely marred by right. Ferrari, or not Ferrari strategy. So used to it being Ferrari strategy, but McLaren strategy. Um, but yeah, I, I think that Oscar, Oscar sent it and, you know, they've got their, you know, the papaya rules of engagement that Ted Kravitz was talking about on the broadcast of like, you know, how they're allowed to fight and, you know, they have their agreement and whatever that agreement is, is what they're, they're going to go with. And right. they, they let Oscar do Oscar things and Lando, you know, Lando definitely is settling for P3 and he's not happy about it. Um, but, you know, that's, you but know. he drove for P3 today. He didn't drive better than that, I don't think. It, like, no, it, that's, Oscar out Exactly. It, fully, 100%. He, he fully was out driven by his teammate. And I think that McLaren did the right thing in, in that sense. I mean, a, a McLaren should have won this race. And so McLaren well, yeah. strategy, in, strategy in general w- was not great, but between the two of them, like that was, that was a P3 drive from, from Lando Norris. And it was a P2 drive from Oscar Piastri. That could have been a P1 if there were like three more laps. I agree. Like, and I, this is the thing that's hard for me when it comes down to this is like, I've been a fan of Lando, like from the sidelines since he started, but I feel like now that he's getting like a taste of success, He's kind of turning into, like, the little pouty kid on the playground where, like, someone took his toy and he's unhappy and he's going to, like, shut down completely and have, a you know, a meltdown and be upset about it. It's like, you're a professional athlete. You're not always going to win all the time. If you want to get better, if you have the car to do so, drive better. Like, it's all on him. So I get that he's frustrated and mad and, like, the strategy, this, that, and the other. But, like, if you qualify differently, put yourself in a position to be in P1 or P2 
where Oscar is like not in front of you, like that's how you do it. You can't just sit and bitch and moan about it when you're the person that put yourself in this position. Yeah, no, I I don't disagree with you. I it, it's it's actually been really interesting to see um now that the McLaren has been more dominant and now that Lando has has seen all the success like all of the people who really don't like Lando Norris in like the Formula 1 fandom. It's it's just it's it's been very interesting to see like their reasonings why and not that we need to go so far off track to go into it. Um but I just thought it was, you know, obviously like Max Verstappen is the villain in a lot of F1 fans' stories and Lewis Hamilton fans. Um, but it's, it's just, it's been very interesting to see the fan reaction to Lando and how Lando has been not necessarily behaving, but the, the way that, um, he has been reacting to what's been happening on track. And that's just been very interesting to me. The, his reaction to Oscar and not letting Oscar like enjoy his first F1 victory really bothered me. Like just as a human being, not even as like an F1 fan, like. That's just so wrong to take that, like, win away from your teammate. Like, if it was someone else on the grid, I'd totally understand. If he, like, lost it in a way that he was unhappy about, I'd get being pissy. But it's your teammate. It's his first F1 win. Like, I don't know. It, it just really bothered me. No, it, it, it also, it, it bothered me too. But anyway, the point is, is McLaren had a double podium today. Zach Brown is living on cloud nine. And as a Red Bull fan, I really just kind of want Zach Brown to go away for a little while. So it'll be nice to have a little two week break before Baku. Yeah. I don't know. He's growing on me, honestly. Oh, still not <laughs> my favorite team so principal. so bad that I'm like coming around to it. You know what I mean? Like Zach a friend the villain to, in all of my stories. That's, I mean, that's how it works. Yes. And then to to just note the drivers and constructors standings real quick. Max is obviously still in the lead in the driver standings. He's got 62 points ahead of Lando. Um, and then Lando is 24 points ahead of Charles Leclerc. So it's tight in the top three. And it is also t- tight in the top three for the constructors. McLaren is only eight points back of Red Bull. So Baku is going to be a really interesting weekend. Um, and I'm really excited for Baku because Baku is like a really cool street track. Um, and then Ferrari is um, 31 points behind McLaren. And if Ferrari is figuring out their issues, they could also, you know, be throwing their hat into the mix um, for for those top two standings, those top two words, for those top two positions. And it could get really, really interesting as we keep going. Well, yeah, because, I mean, Ferrari's only 39 points behind Red Bull and say they have another, you know, really good weekend in Baku and Red Bull has a lackluster weekend in Baku. We could see some movement. Oh, and I think we will. I, I mean, and and this, to to remind everyone, they kept Sergio Perez, and Sergio Perez is handing the constructors' championship to someone else. And those very wealthy Mexican backers are probably going to be paying Red Bull a lot of money to make up for the prize money that they're going to be losing. But anyway, but we digress. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see how Checo, King of the Streets, oh, does gosh. in Baku. <laughs> We shall certainly see. Uh, I'm so excited for Baku. It's going to be that. That track is just really, really cool. Um, I do like that one. Yeah. Okay. So someone else that I want to highlight did not make a podium, but freaking killed it this weekend. Killed Mm -hmm. it might be an overstatement, but I'm really excited. Franco Colapinto, my guy. He is my driver of the day. He And just this whole weekend, like, didn't crash the car. What a win. (laughs) Yeah, like he went out there in you know free practice one. Kimmy, this you know sent from all heavens, God driver, whatever. Um, just completely binned it, and Franco just you know stayed in his lane, didn't cause damage to the car. Also, you know, a step up from Logan Sargent. He didn't yeah. qualify great, so that was the thing. But I think qualifying again, it's his first qualifying in F one. I'll give him a pass. Yeah, um, but he finished in F. 12 or P12. 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 Emily's sleep deprived, still friends in P12, which is really, really exciting. I meant to say he finished P12 in his first F1 race, but I mixed it up. Words hard. Words yeah. Are hard. So, yeah. And and to to compare to you know Sergeant's best finish this season was P11. To, so to make your debut be P12, I yeah I looked it up. Um, oh, I thought it was P14. Hold on, I'm pretty sure it was P11. I know he um, got P11 in Coda, and then he, by, you know, de facto got P10. 
no that that but that was last year hold on right i'm like i need to let me let me double check uh do to do because all my predictions i thought we said p14 you're right i was wrong i forgot about silverstone he did finish p11 at silverstone yeah so you know to to finish p12 when the guy you're replacing could only finish p11 once and couldn't make it in the points and and like the williams does well at um at monza like it's a good track for them obviously yeah. monza was uh the track that nick devries replaced alex albon because alex got his appendix out two years ago um and he managed to outscore heavily nicholas latifi and that is how nicholas latifi ended up losing his seat on the grid so this is this was a really good sign that I think that you know Val's made the right call oh I do too I mean I, I, we can argue it till we're blue in the face and the cows come home about Mick Schumacher over Franco but I think it's you know a great opportunity I just don't know if it's like wrong place wrong or right place wrong time for him though because again I was talking to all my Argentine friends about this because this is the greatest thing ever to happen to them yeah. um, in, in recent history, besides, you know, World Cup and Copa America, not World F1 with an yeah, yeah. driver, I digress. But they're saying, like, there's so much money and so many supporters for him for, like, nine races, which is great. Then, like, what does he do? Because he doesn't have a seat for next season because they've right. already filled it with Carlos Sainz. So then it's, like, he's kind of just still part of their driver development program, their academy, whatever. But it's, like... Does he have to like wait another season to then maybe have a seat? You know, it's it's he's gonna. I just don't want him to stall out in his career because he is older, like we talked about. And it's like, what if he does really, really well and then he just kind of like drops and like we never hear from him again? You know what I mean? Yeah, I I think you know. Obviously, we have eight races to go, so there remains a lot to be seen of his performance. But this could, you know, throw a wrench in, you know another team's plan stakes for who they may be targeting obviously like Bortoletto was part of their stable so he's kind of like their first best option after Botas but I think that we're still you know going to see a not a, a, a exactly similar amount of upheaval in the F1 grid and with seats and silly season but I do think that we will continue to see some big changes over the next couple of years which will give him the opportunity and give more rookies the opportunity to come into Formula One obviously we're going to have have what three rookies next year so far uh wait An Antonelli Behrman Doohan yeah. yeah so we're gonna have three three rookies you know next year I think that we're gonna there there's still a lot of really good opportunities and like I said you know in our um, predictions that this is a really great opportunity for Colapinto to impress a lot of people um and could mean that he's gonna move to a different driver academy and be a, you know and you know, move to the stable of a bigger team. It could, you know, it could mean that he will be at Williams. You know, he'll he'll be the next guy up at Williams. We we don't really know. Um, but I think that all he needs to focus on is drive the car well and don't crash. You know what it could be? Hmm. Okay, let me lay this out for you. Williams and Ferrari. Oh, no, that doesn't nope. work because they don't work. I, why do I always think it's Williams and Ferrari? It's Williams and Mercedes. Yeah, Williams and Mer Mercedes, well, Haas, Ferrari. I know, I just forget about Haas because I know. Haas, but I mean, he could move to Ferrari. He has Italian, he's an Italian descendant. Like, I think his grandparents are Italian. So mm -hmm. that, you know, lines up, and I'm sure Ferrari would love that. They're losing Ali Behrman, who's their reserve driver because he's going to Haas. So they need someone. So maybe if he does really, really well, he becomes a reserve driver at Ferrari. Yeah. And then that could put him into, like, I, th there's definitely a good chance for him to end up on the grid in 26, which is really what he's focusing on right now. And I think right. he will have another year in F2. Hold on. Um, Cause I, I think, I think F2 is another one of those like two seasons and you're out type of deals. Um, yeah. So, uh, and yeah, so he'll have another season in F2 next year. Cause he made two appearances in F2 at the end of 2023, but he didn't do a full season. So this is his, so, this was his first full season. So I think he'll have, he'll have another year in F2 at least um, to so give him time F2, to continue the race. And then he can be a reserve driver somewhere. Um, I mean, and this is one race. <laughs> We've only seen the guy one weekend. He could yeah. crash and burn like Logan Sargent next week. But um, if he continues on this trajectory, I think he has a good spot of securing like a reserve driver spot. And then 
hoping for 2026, but I don't think a ton of contracts go up at the end of 25. So he's looking, he's not looking for a seat until 2027, I don't think. It could be 26, 27. It, 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 it could be a while, but if he shows, and obviously, like like we said, this is one race, who knows, um, right. but this could be, you know, this is this is really just, you know, his opportunity to show people, like, I am good enough for a full-time F1 seat. Yeah. As soon as there's room. Yes. Yeah. Please make room for me. Yes. Also that. Um, and then to move on to um, who disappointed, I would like to to not not really go to start with who, but let's start with what and uh, specifically the upgrades on Yuki Sonoda's car, um, because that was not like obviously Yuki, the car overheated. So he retired on lap seven, which we barely noticed. Well, he was um, no, he was he was also hit by Hulkenberg. Yes. So he has he some issues. Hulkenberg? Yeah, I, I thought. I thought that's who I had a headache this morning, so I only like paid I, I was only able to like focus on like seventy percent of the race. Um but was it no Hulk No I'm, Hulk I'm hit Hulk sure. hit Danny. No, da- Danny oh, Danny hit Danny? Hulk. No, yeah. but here's the thing. Crafty always mixes up Yuki and Danny. They but never get it right. It's no, he doesn't. Up. Um but Cause, yeah, because he retired he retired on lap, lap seven during, the, because of Nico Hulkenberg and Yuki Tsunoda collided. No, it wasn't. It wasn't Yuki because Danny got the penalty for hitting him. Yeah, Danny got a penalty for something else. For for Nico, forcing Nico Hulkenberg found himself hit with a ten second penalty for plowing his hoss into oh, Tsunoda's V car he, at the so, opening sh- uh, chicane. So they both ran. So so. Yes. Okay. So, so yes, he, Hulkenberg, Hulkenberg hit Yuki. Like I said, I had a headache, but then Danny forced Nico off of the, the, track. Off the track. So Danny yes. got a penalty too. And then to also add another disappointment was that poor um, V car mechanic who touched Danny's car um, when he went to serve that, um, that penalty. And um what if if you touch the car in any way when you're trying to serve a penalty then you get another penalty so that gave Danny 10 seconds which was not great didn't really do significant damage to Danny's finishing position because he finished 13th and he would have finished 12th without the penalty um but also very unfortunate and just not the weekend that V-Carb wanted even though Danny did look pretty decent all weekend and whatever those upgrades were that they put on Yuki's car didn't look we never like got a chance very well at all yeah we didn't well, but even so is, he just looked bad yeah but but this is not his track yuki is a dnf like did not start did not start dnf D, like this is not his, yeah i think it's he is the mom's the curse but um, he he really is 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 cursed by by that track but i i just think that yuki just did not look good all weekend even with agreed. the yeah. But we weren't able to like fully see the upgrades because you never know what they're running and the package that they have going on in free practices. Right. And, like qualifying is like one lap, right? So, and then you retired on lap seven. So we just didn't get to see a ton of these upgrades. Maybe when Danny gets them, like for, because Danny should get them next race, I think. I, I, I believe he's correctly. getting them. I or, think like, so, most yeah. of them. Um, then maybe we'll be able to see how the cars are both improving but yeah i, I will know. say i, I, I have the mechanic like yeah he was kicking it, himself i know and he was so disappointed and he just knew and he like literally was just going to like stop the car i don't know i just i hope he has a job tomorrow that's my i think he'll be I fine i, I mean that is like the mechanics make an error because it's like they're not even like no one knows who you are and you're the reason that the, the team got a 10 second penalty yeah yeah not not fortunate but i have i i've liked what i've seen out of danny he he, he's he's been better since the summer break and like this is exactly what ricardo should be doing and i think he's just driving with a little bit more confidence i know you know christian horner had to have made the call of like hey you got to drive really really well to keep your seat for next season possibly become red bull driver again so i think he's really kind of like kicked it into you know first gear and he's just really running with it now so we'll see yeah, exactly. Um, and then to to put this, I don't, I didn't really know if if this should go in who disappointed or who else impressed. But let's talk about Kevin Magnuson. 
Kevin Magnuson has, <laughs> you know, defied the odds and he has made the impossible possible. And if you don't know what we're talking about, um, he got a two penalty point hit to his license for colliding with Gasly, which means he has exceeded the maximum number of points on his super license. And if you know what that means, we're all just kind of scratching our heads, but that means that he is potentially banned for Baku. Oh, no, no, he's banned for Baku. It's official. Oh, just kidding. He is officially banned for Baku. Um, He will not be racing because... He has exceeded his 12 point maximum that you can have on your super license. I like, I understand how he got there because I'm pretty sure he got like 10 points in one race when you just kept dive bombing everybody. I don't remember, yeah, race that was, but it was like, oh my gosh, came back. What did you do? Miami, I think it was Miami. Um, yeah. and it's like, I understand how he's gotten there, but at the same time, it's like. He's so anonymous this season, except for penalty points. Like, we haven't talked yeah. about him at all, except for getting penalty points. And I think, like, one of the funnier parts about this is he collided with Gasly. And Gasly was the last driver who was, like, on the cusp of a race ban by getting 12 points to your license two years ago. So it was, like, this like this whole thing of, like, Gasly watch. Of, like, is he going to get dinged before these points start falling off his license? And then it, you know, and then, of course he ends up hitting Gasly and and what Gasly even is like, I don't know what you're talking about. It was wheel to wheel. He barely touched me. Um, like Gasly is actually campaigning for the band to be reversed. It was like, I'll talk to the stewards and I'll, I'll go to bat for you. Um, but Haas has, has confirmed that they will not appeal the ban. They're just going to live with it. Um, and following the suspension, the 12 points on Kevin's license will be uh, removed. So he will be starting fresh from zero. So he will well, have we seven. Well, we still have nine races or eight races it, it will. So he will have seven races to pick up 12 more points. Um, which I'm not going to put it past him. Has, wouldn't put it past him either. Has anyone hit the limit two times in one season? That That's a really great question. And the last Formula 1 driver to get a single race ban was um, Roman Grosjean in 2012. He was driving for Lotus, but I think it's funny because he was a Haas driver. Okay, so coming out of this, K-Mags is not racing. If Haas can field a second car, whether it's a second car ban or just a driver ban... We will see Ollie Behrman, yes? Or is it going to be, or do you think they would pull someone else? I mean, it's probably going to be Ollie Behrman. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Um, it, I, I think we're just waiting on like the official confirmation that it's going to be him. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that they're going to like penalize the second car itself. I think it's just a, a driver ban. So it's just Kevin Magnuson, not Kevin Magnuson's car. Um, I'm going to run under the assumption that Haas will be fielding two cars and that second car will be driven by Ollie Behrman. Oh, man, he got to drive a Ferrari earlier in the year, and now he gets to drive a Haas. Yeah, so I'm I'm actually very interested. I, I, I'll have to look up, like, the last time somebody has, you know, come into a reserve driver position for two separate teams. Okay, here's my question year. now. Yeah. In a fantasy world, hypothetically, Ollie scores points this weekend. Does he continue to build his driver standing points or does it reset because it's with a different team now? I don't think it would reset. It, it, the the driver the driver's points are for the driver and the constructor that you're with. So I think the only thing that is separate so is he the, could the cons- potentially score points for two different constructors this year. Yes, I I believe because I'm thinking about when Alex Albon was promoted from Toro Rosso to Red Bull. I don't remember how, if if how many points he scored at Toro Rosso, um, you know, he scored at points at Red Bull. So, but they are, you know, he scored at Toro Rosso or Toro Rosso's and the points he scores at Red Bull are Red Bulls, but he gets all of those points to himself. Okay. This is way off track for American fans. You'll understand where I'm going with this. Imagine F1 was like baseball where like right before playoffs, you have like a week window where you can trade people to build up your, like, playoff roster. What if, like, during the summer break, you can just, like, loan someone out to another team, and it would just, like, cause absolute mass chaos? So what if you had, like, Red Bull? Like, what if they're like, hey, Carlos, like, we're going to take you for the last second half. You know what I mean? Like, imagine 
the absolute chaos it would be if you could just have drivers like switching teams constantly. Well, well, yes, but like, did you hear about what happened with the um the Blue Jays catcher who ended up yes, playing yes, for yes, the yes, Red yes. Sox and yeah, he, he he they caught, were playing a delayed he, game. Yeah, and he caught his own. Technically, he caught his own at bat because he was traded to. I'm pretty sure it was the Red Sox and yeah, he was, the Red went from the Blue Jays to the Red Sox. Started the game the game way back a few months ago with the Blue Jays. He was traded to the Red Sox. Resumed the game playing during for the Red Sox. his at bat <laughs> playing for the Red Sox, and somebody had to pinch hit for him. So he was on both sides of the box score. This this is fascinating to me. And and Red Sox manager um, was like, "Oh yeah, we're totally putting him in the game. Like this is one of those like once in a lifetime type, type of situations. Obviously, he's going to be in the lineup." Yeah, wild. But yeah, just like imagine if it was just mass chaos, you were moving people around constantly and like they would pick up your contract. You didn't actually stay with the team. I just think it's fascinating how seats work in F1 compared to like every other sport. Oh yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, I, th- I think that that MLB style in um, trading player rules in Formula One would just like be way too stressful to try to keep track of. And we, we already have headaches enough as it is trying to figure out what the grid is going to look he- like. heavily medicated if that was the case, because my anxiety wouldn't be able to keep up with it. So. Exactly. Like, that's that's a lot. That's that's <laughs> that's almost too much. It's a little rough. But it'd be fun. It would be ridiculous. Uh, it, yeah. Anyway, so getting back on track, going to talk about Monza and how things ended up. So let's go over our predictions. So for poll... Uh, Lando was the pole sitter once again. You did pick Lando. I picked Oscar. I just didn't want to pick Lando. I don't I know. know why. But um, deep down, I, I had a feeling he would get it. So you got a point for that. The podium was Charles, Oscar, Lando. And I don't think in a million years, either one of us would have put any Ferrari on nope. the podium. Um, Not that one. You, you had, we had a mix of like the same podium. You had Lando, Max, Oscar. I had Lando, Oscar, Max. So we both didn't do well there so nope. yeah. I did say though that something was gonna happen like the first corner or the first lap where like Lando and Oscar were gonna switch you did yes it just like was the wrong yeah <laughs> the other way um and then P10 we both picked Lance I don't even know where he finished I'm pretty sure it was no, like no. he finished P19 I was I was like wait a minute how did he end up back there and I like yeah. I don't even know and I didn't even look into it I was like oh yikes I don't know. I don't care because it's Lance Stroll. Um, yeah, pretty much. And K-Mags ended up at P10, which is exciting. I think that's his first points of the season. Uh... Maybe. I know Hulk has been carrying it. Hulk but... has has been carrying the team, but... Do, 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 do. Or it might be like his second P10 finish or something like that. Uh, where is his Formula 1 results? No, this is his third points finish he finished 10th in australia and eighth in austria um he has six whole points well good for kmx yeah um okay so to update you guys on our predictions Catherine has 25 and i have 17 so yes i need this to is start first... picking like the absolute what yeah but th- this is this is the first points excited. for either of us in in a while so right. you know who and knows? It's one for poll. <laughs> and it was one single point. Yes. Yeah. So going into who's going to be the biggest surprise of the weekend, you said that there's going to be drama at the front, and there definitely was. There were, We were moving around, and strategy came into play. Very exciting at the front of the field. So I will give you credit for that one. And then I said that Franco was going to make a statement, um, which – Pretty much I defined as do better than Logan has been doing. Um, and I think he did. Didn't qualify well, like we were saying, but he did finish P12. Solid race. Um, I'm very excited to see what we get out of him for the next yeah, seven races. He, he looked decent all weekend. And then if you compare him to Alex Albon, who really, I think that's the metric that, that we're going to be right. comparing him to. He was within, you know, one, two tenths. I was not too far back from, you know, the the lead driver on Williams at the moment. Um, And that's exactly where you want your driver to be, especially a driver that's coming in to the 16th race of the season. Who's never driven in formula one before. Right. And I think I truly think so in qualifying, he kind of had like a mental error, which caused him to not qualify well. So, and again, it's his first qualifying of F1, like give him a break. So I think if he would have even qualified in like P16, maybe I think he would have gotten in the points. 
Yeah, it, it probably would have been, been been close. They, you know, they were good on strategy. And like we said, Mons is a really good track for them. So this was a really like great place to debut in a place where you know the car is going to be pretty decent. Right. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he does on a street race in Baku. Yeah. Yeah, that'll that'll be it'll be a real big test for for him. I think he's going to be spending a lot of time in the sim between now and two weeks from now. Yeah, for sure. Moving into my favorite recap that we do is who's going to do a dumb. So, Catherine, you said that Ferrari just in general was going to mess up, have a dumb. Um, and they didn't. And they didn't. And I love to see it. I mean, obviously, I would have preferred Carlos to win on his birthday, but they had a solid showing. Um, very, very happy with, with their performance. So. Yeah, they they I I was concerned that they like lost all of their good strategy luck um or used up all of their good strategy luck in Zandvoort. Um clearly they had a little bit left um for Monza for their home race. There were a lot of happy Italians and a lot of you know one very happy Frenchman who speaks Italian now in Fred Vasseur. Um I I also just wanted to point out like how I, I was very entertained by the fact that all of Charles's post-race radio calls were in Italian um, and like Crofty had to get a translation. Um, and like, I, I maybe caught, you know, every, every 10th word because I took, you know, many years of Spanish and, you know, between high school and college um, and the, the languages are not entirely too dissimilar. Um, it was nice to have a little bit of the, the translation so we knew exactly what he was saying. But it's so interesting because like, obviously he, he French is his first language, right? In Monaco? Yes. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yes. So to hear a Frenchman speaking Italian, like, it doesn't have, like, that Italian bounce and inflection. So it sounded like, like, I knew it was Italian, but it was just, it's so interesting to hear him speak Italian and then hear, like, Carlos speak Italian because Carlos speaks Spanish, so I think it's a little bit more natural for him. But it's, and then you hear Fred and, like, Fred kind of sounds like Charles when he speaks Italian. It's just, it's really interesting to hear them all speak Italian because it doesn't truly feel or, or sound Italian. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's 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 also fascinating to, to remember, and like maybe the, it, this is probably just in general, it's more common because in Europe, they do speak a lot of more different languages than just, you know, I grew up speaking English and took Spanish in high school and in college. But, you know, the fact that they all speak like four, five, six, seven languages is just bananas to me. Uh, they can get by decently in most European countries. And I know that like, you know, romance languages are all kind of like fundamentally the same. So it's not that hard once you know one, you know most of them. Um, but still, it's very difficult to wrap my brain around it because like I, I can ask where the bathroom is in Spanish, but can't do much more than that. I can tell you how wine is made in Spanish. Yes, you can. <laughs> but other than that, no, I, I can get by pretty well in Spanish. But yeah, it's, I mean, I know it's mostly for media, which is great. Um, and being at that level of, you know, world-class athlete, it kind of comes with the territory. Also, Ferrari forces you to learn Italian if you're a Ferrari driver. So yep. there's also that. Um, anyways, getting back on track. Final thoughts. I think it was great. Love Monza. I don't want to wait another year for Monza. Um, right. I love Monza so much more than Imola. Imola is just such a mer track. We've talked about how F1 has really outgrown Imola, but I don't think they will ever outgrow Monza. No, no, they they really won't, especially once we have the new regulation and those cars are going to be a little bit smaller. Um, there's just there's something about like yes, Imola is you know an, a classic you know historic F1 race, but there's something about Monza that is just so intrinsically Formula One that it's like night and day. And you know, Imola is like oh yeah, we're going to Imola, but Monza is like oh. It's Monza. It's, it's Monza. going down. It's going to be great. Well, I I truly think it's because this is the home. This is like the home race for Ferrari. Like I know they claim, you know, Imola as it as well, just because it's in Italy. But Monza is like truly their home race. The fans are absolutely insane, and I think that's what makes it so much better. Kind of like the you know Zanbor. Everyone is in orange for Max, and it's really exciting. But it's just the Tifosi take it to a whole nother level. Oh yeah, exactly. It's like when you have one of those environments where it's like, this is the home base, you can make the claim that like, you know, V-Carb is also technically an Italian team. Um, and V-Carb also stakes, stakes a claim at, at Imola as, as their home race. And they also technically do stake a claim at Monza, but like Monza's Ferraris. Exactly. Exactly. But 
Yeah. Very excited. I love this track. And also, I'm looking forward to seeing, like, I feel like this was a really, really good race to set us up for the rest of the season. Like, this race got us all super close in constructors and drivers, and now it could be anyone's game because we still have seven races left. Yes. Yeah. There, there's, there's a, there's a lot more racing to go. Um, and it's, it's going to be really exciting from here on out. And it's only seven races left for K mags. We have everyone, everyone else has eight races. I can't keep track. I just, I try so hard to do numbers in time and I will always get it wrong. Math is really, really hard. So it's okay. Um, but let's go into oh. our going off track moment of the weekend or our yes. off track moment. Let's do our off track moment. So Catherine has her F1 fun fact and I have my off the track moment. So going off track here, something that I love to talk about is money on this podcast and just in general of F1, like there's so much money in it and it's really interesting to see where it all comes from, where it all goes. So something that did happen or news that came out was that Santander Bank is leaving Ferrari as a sponsor going forward. So they did have a contract that was up for renegotiation for starting in 2025. Um, it did, it will end at the end of the season and they are not renewing the sponsorship deal. The original one that was originally signed in 2021 was for $60 million. So like 20 million a season, not something to you know joke about. That's a lot of money. Um, but they are, they did come out and say that they want to stay with formula one and stay on the grid, but they're looking elsewhere and they are currently looking at Williams. So my thought, and just the interesting thing about sponsorships in general is how they move with drivers. So Carlos Santander, if you don't know, is a Spanish bank. Carlos is a Spanish driver. He's moving to Williams. Naturally, I think that partnership would make sense for him to move to Williams. Williams getting more money is great because they are one of the smaller teams, but it's just really interesting to see how sponsors move with drivers like Monster, left Mercedes, Tommy's leaving Mercedes. They're kind of like moving away because certain drivers are moving away, right? Because like Lewis was the monster and Tommy guy. They're moving away from that now. So I just, I just, I didn't know, Catherine, if you ever thought of it like that or if I'm just overthinking it, but the flow of money and how sponsors are, you know, tagged to teams has always been super interesting to me. Well, no, I mean, it, it, it definitely is. And it's, it's really one of those things. And, and like you talk about with like Joe Guan Yu, all like he, there's a stake has a lot of, you know, sponsorships from China because like only because Joe is Joe. on the team. Um, and then if you think about like recent, you know, more recently, um, Cola Pinto, he shows up on the formula one grid and all of a sudden Williams is announcing Mercado a sponsor. Libre, like Mercado <laughs> Libre. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's very cool. Like, you know, once Sergio Perez leaves Red Bull one way or another, all of those like Mexican bank sponsors are going to be leaving um, and the damage will be done. But anyway, um, the, like, it's, it's very, very interesting to see, you know, who goes where, who's following drivers, you know, in the, in the case of monster, you know, you know, leaving one driver and going to another, you know, going from Lewis to Lando. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And it's one of those like, you know, underlying things in formula one that is absolutely fascinating or we're just big nerds. It could be the thing that I always think about is like, where does your like performance to money ratio need to be right? Like if you are like superstar driver, but have no money coming in, like, are you more attractive than someone who's like, maybe a 70% driver, but you have like 80% money. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's always been interesting, interesting to me to see how people get to the grid as well, because like it's in a very expensive sport. If you look into all of, all of the drivers' families, like I would say probably 45% of them have come from very, very wealthy families. And then the rest, like some got really lucky and then some were just out lights out drivers and people were begging to sponsor them because they were really good drivers um but yeah it's just always interesting to like understand how people come to the grid like is that why joe originally came to the grid just because he had a ton of money i think he was just good um in the in the case of joe he he was just good but it's it it's like when you think about 
you know, drivers who have to leave their home countries. Danny Ricardo had to leave Australia and move to Europe. Sergio Perez so had Oscar. to leave, you know, Sergio Perez had to leave Mexico. And, you know, he there there were some, um, you know, wealthy people in, in, in Mexico who sponsored him and his ability to go and drive and, you know, learn how to be a driver in Europe. So it, it, it really is, sometimes it's about luck. Sometimes it's about how much money your family has. In the case of like Logan Sargent is from a really wealthy family. Obviously, they have strolls from a really wealthy family. Nicholas Latifi's family, I think, is like big in banking in Canada. Um, so if you know, think about it. And and there are drivers who are on the grid because they have money. If you think about it, Michael Schumacher was actually a pay driver. Nikita Mazepin was a pay driver. Um, so you have a whole spectrum of of you know, different ways that you can get to formula formula one. And sometimes you can buy your way in, but then it does come to a point where you do have to be good enough to stay in to it. stay. Yep. No, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. So that's my, my off track moment for, for the weekend. So. Wonderful. I love good that. Game. I know. Right. Okay. So coming up next, we've been talking about it all podcast, but we are going to Baku so in two, two weeks. weeks. We will be in Baku. Except for K-Mags, we won't see him again until Singapore. Um, maybe we'll see Ali Berman. Maybe we won't. Who knows? Hope so. Um, but yeah, so that's super exciting. Next week, stay tuned to if we have a podcast or not. We'll <laughs> see. see. These off weeks, man, you just never know. But hopefully we can get a maybe a little sneak a surprise episode F101 for you guys in between Monza and Baku. But yeah. I'm excited. I feel like we haven't had a street race in a while, so I'm very excited to get back to the streets. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely been a minute, and I'm I'm really I Baku is just such a great track, and it's also like because of the calendar like regionalization that they they've implemented for this season yeah. and going forward um, to be a little bit more eco friendly when it comes to you know the international traveling circus that Formula One is Baku, which is usually like race four or five, is now in like the latter half of the season. Um, so it's it's just it feels really weird that like we're finally going to Baku when we should have gone to Baku in like April, May. Yeah, it feels like we should be going to Suzuka and we're going to Baku. Yeah, yeah. So it's so. It, I think that that's going to be that's gonna be really fun. I this this is always just like a really cool race. It's a really cool race track. Um and I'm really excited to see what we get out of, you know, a little bit different of a look, you know, going from a street track, you know, or going from a purpose-built track to a street track. I completely agree. Could not have said it better myself. Well, that is it for our Italian Grand Prix 2024 <laughs> recap episode. Thanks for going up to us, guys.